A few years ago, I had a little fun with this video on landings gone wrong at the notorious St. Bart's Airport in the Eastern Caribbean. It has a stupid short 2100 foot runway and there's a hill off the approach end of runway 10. Quite a trick to get in there and stopped. With that in mind, here's an interesting way to do it. Just follow the nap of the hill with a high sink rate and cram it down short of the numbers. When the right gear leg collapses, you get that nifty ground loop and you get in really short. Tearing out the runway edge markers and the signage helps slow you down too. Never mind that you can't use the airplane again. This happened last week, by the way. Sorry for the sarcasm and anyway, there but for the grace of God go us all. But there's a good thing or two to learn from this mishap and it has nothing to do with Gustav III. That's the formal name of the airport. I'm not planning a trip there and you probably aren't either. If you are, you're supposed to qualify ahead of time to land there. The broader useful lesson is what can be applied here to all landings anywhere but short field landings in particular. The accident approach was too high, but here's what a good one looks like. Just skimming the top of the hill, then following the profile of the hill toward the runway. This video, which also popped up last week, shows an airplane that is just crazy low. It's about five feet above the fence. If the pilot sneezed, he'd take out that rail and the landing gear in one shot and slide down the hill like a first grader on a sled. Most of the approaches split the difference. Kind of like this. So the accident airplane, it's a Piper Aero, is too high. To recover that, the pilot puts on a heroic sink rate that appears to put the airplane in a deep mush. Maybe not a full stall, but pretty close. It hits the runway with a high vertical rate and that's likely what collapsed the landing gear, although a mechanical fault might have contributed too. It's kind of a carrier landing without the tail hook, the ramp, or an LSO. A robust application of power, say 10 feet above the touchdown, might have saved it without adding too much rollout distance. As it is, the touchdown is just past the numbers, so the pilot had plenty of runway left. Another way to recover from being too high is a forward slip, which you can do without losing so much speed to mush the thing. Just remember that when you come out of that slip, you'll lose drag and you'll pick up a knot or two of speed. And speed control is the essence of good short field landings and slower is better because it reduces the energy at touchdown. The two most common ways of doing this are to set up an angle to the planned touchdown point, slow to the lowest practical speed, and adjust the angle with depth power application. Second is to aim short of the intended touchdown point, level out briefly, then drag the airplane in with power. Chopping the throttle just ahead of the landing point puts the airplane on the deck. This seems to be the favored method at stall competitions like this demonstration event recently held at Sun and Fun. You can see the brief level out here, but maybe a touchdown shorter than intended. That's always a risk with the drag-in method. Setting the speed correctly comes from experimentation. But whatever it is, it's not the often mentioned 1.3 VSO, but something closer to 1.1, especially if the airplane is light with a lower stall speed. Weight can make a huge difference in stall speed and also in the approach speed to fly. This is from the Diamond DA40 Operating Handbook. That's a 15 knot spread in approach speeds between light and heavy, and that can make the difference between an easy rollout and one that ends up in the weeds. This is true of all airplanes. At the stall events, they sometimes fly right at stall or maybe even a little less, dragging in with a lot of power. At St. Bart's, the piston airplanes that do the best are often the Britain Norman Islanders if they haven't all been chased away by the turbine caravans and PC-12s. Watch this one. Touchdown with minimum energy, almost good enough to make the first turn off. This twin otter is an example of a high angle approach aimed short of the numbers and right on speed. It looks high initially, but the approach angle just skims the lower part of the hill. This one, also a twin otter, crosses the hill lower but appears to have too much speed, turning the landing into a float fest and 600 feet further down the runway. The lens compression makes the remaining runway look shorter than it is, 
there's really 1200 feet remaining past the second turnoff. Watching these videos, it's natural to ask, why don't they just land the opposite way on runway 28? Well, they do if the wind permits, like this islander plopping it down in 800 feet on runway 28. What's interesting is that viewed from the opposite direction, that hill doesn't seem nearly so daunting. So the takeaway is that these two accidents are the result of poor speed control. This one was too fast, this one too slow. So aim for the Goldilocks speed. Just right and figure out what that is by experimenting. Hill or no hill, there's a little cottage industry of X-plane sim pilots stuffing jets into St. Bart's like this A380, leading Jehan Catelli, the author, to conclude that prohibition against larger airplanes is just ridiculous. You probably need that sort of sense of humor if you're going to land here, and to anyone who has tackled St. Bart's successfully or not, even the sim pilots, we lift a beer to your intrepid airmanship and for having the guts to even try it. For Avweb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching.